Well, if you really want to know, uh, he's, uh, he's a very religious man. Martin Scorsese. Um, what did you ask me, Peter? I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. Look at that. It's terrible. I don't want to look cool. at it, Peter. That's it. Hide it. I'm fine. So it. nobody will know. Hide it. It's not dawn yet. But this man, Martin Scorsese, that everybody thinks is a respectable filmmaker in America, sleeps with a crucifix over his bed that the top of it, of Christ, pulls out into a big blade knife for killing is the most vicious weapon I've ever seen in my life. Do you know that fell on him once and missed? I didn't know it missed. What made you decide to make a concert, as to film a concert? And why did you pick Marty to do it? I already told you that, Peter. Well, tell me again. Because he was the only person that knew enough about the fucking music and grew up on it, just like me, and was basically as much a punk as the rest of us and could relate to the whole fucking thing. And so he was the only show in town. Now, do you get the picture? Yeah. yeah. If there was somebody else to call, I would have called him. <laughs> when you're working with this man, He's, uh, I ended up, you know, months later, uh, after working with him, I eventually started, without even realizing I was doing it, I started calling him Maestro. He believes uh, the same thing that uh, Napoleon believes, that any man who sleeps more than three hours a night is a fool. Mm. And uh, he's checking it out. I met him first when he did Mean Streets, but I didn't really know him. Actually, the first time I was aware of him was at uh, the Woodstock Festival where the band played. Mm. And uh, Marty was the guy, uh, actually, Marty was the guy calling the shots the whole time that that concert went on for days. So that was his first proving ground that I was aware of, that the man does not sleep. I refer to him as Maestro. When we were working with him, any time that I would look up and I would see, uh, and I would look up for, you know, whatever uh, reason there was, when you had to look at the director, he's conducting. And when we were playing music, um, every once in a while I would see him there. He'd be on the crane or wherever he would be in the shot. Uh, that they were doing and I would see his arms flailing away in the air you know but I tried not to get to, to notice too much or pay too much I was afraid I'd forget what I was doing or something you know so as time went on I would notice more and more and more and I realized he was conducting so when it came time that we were doing the stories on the road we were talking about it, where he was sitting right in front of us, the guys in the band, you know, and we didn't know nothing about movies or what the hell we were doing. So we kind of relied on the guy just to let us know when we were hot and when we were not, you know? And the whole technique was that whatever we were doing, he would conduct it. And I'd be talking away, and he'd be going like, uh, 
<laughs> like this with his hands, and then he would go. And then he'd go. You know, and I'm trying to talk in this. Have you ever talked to anybody when they're going like this at you and you're talking? As a matter of fact, in the movie, The Last Wallace, I mean, it might even look strange because basically what I'm doing, you know, when I'm telling those stories in the film, is I'm watching this guy either, I didn't know whether it was sign language or he had a nervous tick or I was supposed to relate to it. He never mentioned it. He only did it. Maestro, I want to play you a, a song before we knock off here. Certainly. This uh, song, Peter, it's got nothing to do with anything, but uh, you'll understand exactly what we mean. This is by Van the Man again. Okay. <laughs> All my life is something Martin Scorsese once said. At 34, Scorsese has directed Mean Streets, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Taxi Driver, and New York, New York. Formidable credits in an industry of creative and artistic inconsistency. In this documentary, we look at Scorsese and the people he works with. Went to New York University, started taking film courses. Of course, I've been interested in films for years and years before, but seeing a lot of films, seeing them, going to movies a great deal, watching a lot of films. Angeles, I'm gonna drink a mug. 
And if California slides into the ocean Like the mystics and statistics say it will I predict this motel will be standing Until I pay my bill Don't the summer gangs to the trees Don't the trees look like crucified bees Don't you feel like desperados under the up in the mornings with shaking hands and I'm trying to find a girl who understands me but except in dreams you're never really free don't the sun look angry at me how long have you known Martin Scorsese and how did you first meet him I've known Martin for better part of 10 years now almost met him in the winter i think of 1968 when i was a reporter at time and doing a story on student filmmakers i didn't i was only on else for uh, something like four or five days so i didn't really get to know him and there was a welfare worker that kept bugging him and everything i think the first time we saw each other was in a cinema class at nyu uh, he was uh, editing a picture and i was uh, directing one in one of their student classes and uh, we were aware of each other, but we were never really introduced. I was coming out of the subway at 4th Street and 6th Avenue, and I was uh, pounced upon by uh, several color gentlemen and Puerto Rican uh, gentlemen, and they were literally beating the shit out of me. And Marty happened by, and he saw what was going on, and he uh, put down his briefcase and joined right in. He picked a stick up, Hit me a couple of times over the head. Hit me uh, with a uh, two by four that's been soaking in motor oil since 1957, so it left no spl splinters. Just beat the shit out of me. Just, just ravaged me viciously. I remember the first conversation we had was about Abbott and Costello, you know, about the relationship between the two of them, and you know, I actually seriously analyzed a, a, a slapstick comedy thing, and I used to try to uh, see uh, why it worked and what worked and what didn't work. I think uh, making films is an obsession and uh, very few people can put everything they have into it. You know, they have other gods, uh, but I think Marty has one god and that's film. Well, I was originally involved in the priesthood for a little while. Then from there I was going out to education, teaching in English, that sort of thing. It was literature, and that's how I said. You were going to become a priest? Yeah. Mm. But what happened was that there was a sort of a switch, and um, wound up, uh, found myself at NYU taking taking the liberal arts courses, but uh, sprinkled with uh, what they called communications. Yeah. You don't make up for your sins in the church. You do it in the streets. You do it at home. The rest is bullshit, and you know it. Going back to Mean Streets, um, I think it's your voice, voiceover on the soundtrack. Can you... Well, at first it was just a, a scratch track, in a sense, a cue track, mm. until I got the actor's voice in there. But then it said I liked that it was more of a connection with my own voice. Then I did do the actor's voice, and I had to cut both. One or, one or two filmmakers that have influenced you? I just talk about guys I like. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of other filmmakers that have uh, influenced me, but I mean, I like uh, Ford, and I like John Ford, and then... Uh, um, Wells and Hawks and Sam Fuller, a great deal, very strong relationship and uh, influenced by uh, Michael Powell, Michael Powell the films. Director, yeah. Yes. Um, um, from um, a small back room and uh, all those, those films. Even Tom and films. Even Tom, especially. Yeah.
I do have a favorite that I just like watching over and over again. It's The Searchers, John Ford's The Searchers. But it's a funny thing because when I when I came out, I saw it when I came out. See, I was 13 years old. I graduated from I was graduated from uh, grammar school. And that was in, that night. My friends and I went out to celebrate. And went to the Criterion Theater in New York and walked in in the middle, which is what we used to do in those days. You know, walk in the middle of the film, and there's John Wayne up there and this whole thing going on, and we loved it. And we saw it when it came down to the neighborhood theaters, and we saw it again and again and again. And every year, I've seen it several times, and it's it, it's just it stood up. Every time I see it, it stands up, and it's my favorite. Crossing over to Taxi Driver, would you would you say it was a political film? I think they're all political films. But not in the sense, you know, political film, not in the sense yeah. of uh, uh, what would be a political film, um, a film which is very good. Uh, uh, oh, it's a long one, though. Sorrow and the Pity, you know, it was a very, very long film. It was a, obviously a political film. Um, of course, it's a documentary. I mean, I'm giving you a bad example, but mm. it's a very brilliant film. And the thing is that it's... The politics I'm talking about are kind of personal politics. I see, yeah. But, you know, Do you really it represents, represents Main Street, represents the personal politics, represent uh, the politics, politics of a whole subculture and the politics of a people that um, is rather subversive. Do you, do you relate in the character in Taxi Driver in any way, Travis? Yeah, as I said, but it was something that uh, we had to do uh, as a part before. When I mentioned that, uh, there's something about it, about parts of yourself that you don't, that are there, that uh, underground kind of things of yourself that you don't want to discuss, that somehow it's better to express on film or, or, or on paper, something like that. And then I became very friendly with Marty when we were both out at Warner Brothers. He was editing The Medicine Ball Caravan, and I was directing Get to Know Your Rabbit. And we, during those dark days, that's when we became very friendly and tight. You introduced Robert De Niro to Martin, didn't you? Uh, well, I sort of suggested Bobby to Marty because I'd worked with him way back in 1963 in a picture called The Wedding Party and then Greetings and Hi Mom. So you worked twice, uh, three times with him? Yes, three right times with him. And uh, I thought that they would have a real affinity toward each other. And when Marty was thinking about Mean Streets, I, ca I think I suggested him to uh, Marty. Uh, and then they met at a party at Jay Cox. I think it was a Christmas party or Thanksgiving party. They were just two kindred spirits, two people uh, of whom we, that is my wife and I, were both very fond. And we felt that they would like each other very much and perhaps uh, grow with each other in a certain way and find things to, to like and make use of in each other. With Marty, we have, I guess, the same feelings about things or sensibilities about things when we work. And uh, part of it might be because, um, well, Marty's not, not afraid to take a chance on something because he doesn't, you know, that's the only way he knows how to do it. So we do something and it, you know, uh, like I'll try something or want to try this or that or some variation on a scene or a particular moment of a scene. And uh, he'll say, yeah, let's try it. And the same with him. He'll want to try something. and. And usually we just say, yeah, let's try it. It seems right when we say it to each other. Brian De Palma, the yeah. director, you know, the director of Carrie and the other films, yeah. he, uh, he said he used Bobby because he had used Bobby in Greetings and High Mom and a bunch of other pictures, a wedding party. And uh, he said, uh, uh, you know, this guy's great. And Jay Cox, who was a critic at Time Magazine, his wife, Verna Bloom, had worked with Bobby in the uh, stage in New York. And that's yeah. when I met him. You know, people say, uh, think that we have a background or something that, that gives us a certain... I, I, for one another. Yeah, it's not true. We just have a certain uh, feeling about things. It has nothing to do with our backgrounds. It's right. just uh, so we came to become friends in the last few years, and uh, uh, it just uh, you know we, we can look at something and have an idea about it. It's just that we're both sort of open to trying something. Not that it works. I don't want to say that because I heard once uh, somebody make some statement how he, he did this little thing and. He thought it was so good. He and the director had this great relationship, and I saw it, and I thought it was terrible. So I don't want to, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to, you know, say. But we, for ourselves, you know, we have a. It at least makes it fun for us to do it. And you see similar characters. You see similar aspects of certain characters. You know, like uh, there are similar aspects of Charlie and Johnny Boy in uh, Jimmy Doyle in New York, New York. Yeah, uh, very interesting aspects there. And also in Francine, there are similar aspects of the same two guys. Mm. Uh, Is there any of you? A great deal, yeah, a great deal. And, uh, and Alice, and, 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 uh, and the little boy in Alice, and the Harvey Keitel's part in Alice, and, and of course in uh, Taxi Driver, the, what goes on inside the guy's mind is a lot of the unspoken things that a lot of people feel. You know, when I say a lot of people, I'm talking about personal stuff. You know. <laughs> Yeah.
you know, in Johnny Boy in Mean Streets, you developed that, that character from perhaps... Uh, well, that was a different thing. That's another... Um, another... Another way of something working. Something that you knew anyone. Something that I knew and people I knew, I could draw a lot from some from people and somewhat experiences that I that I've had and seen. Uh, okay, well, if you can see an experience, whatever. But <laughs> <laughs> come on, what are you doing? What you doing for me? Don't show up tonight. We'll see what happens to you. How much? How much money you got for Michael tonight? You got nothing. You got eight fucking dollars on Well, uh, here, take, uh, take 20. Yeah, take 22. Would you rate that I'll make, uh, that I'll make $30 for beef tomorrow tonight. I'll keep 11 for the weekend. Is there any of Johnny Boy in you sometimes? Well, everything I do, I have a piece of me comes yeah, out. Right. You have to find, you have to make it work for yourself. And then you have to also be aware of the character and, and what's, what's called for in the, uh, in the script. And uh, that's really important, otherwise, you know, you can go off somewhere. Was yeah, anybody else considered for the part of uh, Johnny Boy? <sighs> no. Not really. It's hard to say. It really is hard to say because uh, uh, there was some thinking, we were thinking of shuffling around the same characters, the same actors in different parts. But exactly what parts and what actors, I'm not sure. I mean, I can't honestly say that now. I do remember that, uh, you see, I've never seen Bobby Act before, and I do remember. Uh, him talking to me. You hadn't seen him no. before at all? No, he tried on a hat that he thought the character would have, and of course that's the hat in the film, and he said, oh, you've got the guy, that's exactly it. Marty said that he just saw you in the hat and that was it. I, that, well, that could or could not be true, I don't know. I, no? Sometimes those things get all turned around, so, yeah. yeah. I don't think it Wait, Were you happy with your performance in Mean Streets? Yeah, I thought it was okay. Hey, where'd you get the hat? You like this hat? This would be a $25 Dobbs hat. What's the difference? It's a $2 sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you go with a jukebox? I can't even knock them. Hey, the girls like the music loud. Girls, you call those skanks girls. Hey, 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 what's the matter with this kid, huh? Hey, there ain't nothing wrong with me, my friend. I'm feeling fine. Keep your mouth shut. Hey, you tell me that in front of this asshole. All right, all right. We're not going to pay. We're not paying. No, we but well, why? We just said we were gonna have a drink. We're not paying because this guy, this guy's a fucking mook. But I didn't say nothing. nothing. And we don't pay mooks. A mook? I'm a mook. Yeah. What's a mook? A mook? What's a mook? I don't know. What's a mook? You can't call me a mook. I can't? No. I get the mook. Well, Mean Street was done as a... Uh, was written as an outline after I completed the first version because I made three versions of this particular film. Who's that knocking at my door? Which I believe was shown in it was shown in England. Uh, I, I think so. Yeah, it's been shown in England recently. Yeah, recently, and that was like a rough sketch. And everything that I couldn't get in that film, aside from the fact that the version that is now in England, or who's that knocking, was nowhere near the version that I'm talking about that I just. Uh, completed. In other words, I completed a version of it, which was yeah. very, very sparse. It yeah. wasn't quite right. Everything that I couldn't get into it because of money problems, I wrote down an outline. The Mean Streets is a, um, I think, a magnificent film uh, with Bob De Niro and and, and, and uh, uh, Harvey Keitel. Beautifully done film, and something that's so sensitive, so good. I, I think you miss it the first time as you see it. You got to see it twice. You have to see it twice, <laughs> and you should you should see it again. Two months later, to realize uh, how uh, how sensitive an artist this man is. Uh. We were trying to do Mean Streets, which was the big project that we had, and it took like something like six, seven years on and off working on it, and we did uh, constantly putting ideas down and, and working. Uh, his wife hated me, and my wife hated. I was married then. Uh, my wife, so we used to uh, he couldn't come to my place because we were, you know. Get a job, his wife used to say, you know. <laughs> Mine used to say, get a job. What is this movies? Are you crazy? Work anywhere, you know, nine to five. But uh, I didn't think that was a good idea, neither did he. But uh, so we used to, I had a car, you know. I had this old car and we used to stay in the car and drive around and find a place to park. And we actually used to come up with ideas while sitting in the car. I used so to ride in the car. Yeah, that's too many monkey children. Too many 
John. And I think music is important, uh, especially in the kind of films he makes, because he's very much into getting emotion uh, out of the audience, uh, whether positive or negative. Because you know, he, he's a very emotional person, and, and uh, he'd rather arouse emotions than uh, make any kind of a statement. How much did you collaborate with the composer of the soundtrack in Taxi Driver? Did you collaborate with him at all, Bernard Herrmann? Uh, one or two phone calls. That's all? Yeah. You followed Mean Streets with Alice. Right. Right. Um, would you say it was a difficult film to make? Yeah. Yeah, it was a hard film to make. I mean, they're all hard films to make. It's just a matter of, uh, in Alice, uh, I try to look at uh, a certain subject matter from another point of view. What really, from my own, my own knowledge as well as for... Uh, yeah, what sort know. of things did you learn from Alice? If, as a... <laughs> I don't know if I learned anything. <laughs> <laughs> I liked Alice's in the Fear and More and Taxi Deer War more than anything else I've ever done. He was he was very nervous in the beginning about taking me on because he always felt like someone some cop was gonna come up and bang handcuffs on him because I was so young. I'll go for the same actor as much as I can, uh, if the part is right for him. I mean there's certain actors I've used in my films with small parts so I'm dying to give to a big part too, you know. But uh, the films I'm doing just don't, they don't seem to call for it. You know, I like, I like when you, you have a kind of relationship with them. You, you, you know what you can get, you know how much you can get, you know where you can get it. Mm -hmm. And they know, what they, they know how they can trust you because they know they've worked with you before. That's all. Yeah. That's kind of nice. He's made a film on you, hasn't he? It's called uh, American Boy, isn't it? Yeah. What, do, what is that about? Oh, that, that's about a lot of trouble. Oh, boy, that's that about a lot of trouble. What period does it cover? It covers uh, between 62 covers between the Kennedy years and the Nixon years. In your life? In my life. And how that affected you or what? And, uh, yeah, how it affected everybody. And I'm used as a central character because uh, the experiences that I went through, a lot of people can relate. Not everybody can relate to every one of my experiences, but they can relate to one. Who is it? It must be my lunch. Oh. Can, this would be very interesting. <laughs> this is Mr. Prince. Can we, we should probably can photograph we, him. Can you just hold on, Phil? Who's We're shooting. Shh. Phil? Yeah. Is there anything important? Uh, I just wanted to... Yeah. Steve, why don't you run over there because it might be important. <laughs> <laughs> that was Mr. Prince. Right behind the cash register, the uh, owner kept a 44 Magnum, a six shot, right? I turned, I cocked it, turned around, and the guy was just coming through the door. Just coming through the door, the, the, the doorway. And just as he was coming through the door, I fired. My father always taught me, never aim a gun at anybody. Never, ever aim a gun at anybody. Unless you're going to shoot him. And if you're gonna shoot him, kill him. A gun is a definite, uh, it's a definite deterrent. I mean, it, it has a definite meaning. When you pull a 38 automatic out on somebody and you level it on them, you say, hey fella, let's stop the argument, let's cut the talk, let's cut the bullshit, it's all over, go home. It definitely does the trick. The guy goes home. This is an outdoor, this is a, what do they call it, a hot tub? A hot tub? Lobster! A lobster! Try to get it, Steve, I'll hold the thing. Uh, I, I personally <laughs> do this. <laughs> try, try, try to trick. You remember Angels with Dirty Faces? He went to the chair and I got in trouble. <laughs> Just get it there. Ma! Can you tell us a little about uh, Stephen Prince? He acted in Taxi Driver. He was the gun salesman in Taxi Driver. But he's also, he, he's like an associate works with me. I decided to make a film on him. It's like a magazine profile in the sense that you take a character and you make a film an odd length, uh, either 48 minutes, whatever it comes out to be, an hour, an hour and 10 minutes, maybe, maybe a little longer. But basically it's a person telling stories, flashbacks to his past. It's really almost like a life story. I did it with my parents first with a film called Italian American. My mother and father is another title. That's here. right. And that's 48 minutes long, and that's basically just hanging around, sitting around the table talking. Mm. And they talk about their parents. And uh, what really came out of that is much more than just about a film about immigration, which it was intended to be. That was the original intention of film about immigration. It came out to be just a film about a love story between two people and a 
40 year mar 40 year old marriage which is very interesting and relationships and their relationship to me and uh, so what happens in steven's film is that it's not only about america and about him but it's about him and me and his relationships to people how he relates to people well i guess so everybody would say that and, and i too that i admire is the way he works with his actors he gets you know just yeah such exciting things out of him well, you seem like uh I, I don't do your kind of stuff you know i mean I mean, I can try. Oh, yeah, try, try. Look, I got Ted, uh, we have these two concepts for an album, which two companies turned down, and you'll just love. Yeah, <laughs> listen, I, uh, well, let me think about it, okay? And you'll be here, and you'll be busy, and you'll be working, you'll just, it's not such a good idea, is it? Is that uh, a, the level, or should I charge a hint more? Oh, I think it should be really, but don't forget, don't forget, I mean, we're just reading through here. When it comes in, he's going to be coming down the stage, he's going to grab you. Right. And I go, oh, great, boy, I can invest. I mean, I can record. I'm going to invest. I'm going to just totally invade your whole fucking life. <laughs> and take off this guy and his poor guy. Oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. The fort, you know. Uh, let's hold off over here and let's see what's going to happen. Uh, because, uh, you know, first you moved in the closet and the thing. And, uh, <laughs> there are directors who get up and give line readings mm -hmm. and show you exactly what to do. He doesn't do that. He says, well, what do you think it should be? Suddenly, the responsibility you feel is on you. So you come through for him more. Directors who act out, sometimes for a certain actor, that might be an interesting way to do it. And I, and, uh, I could see that if, if there was something that I wouldn't particularly understand, but the director might understand it because he experienced it or he just he's observed this, so he would act it out, I'd be, I would be able to see it. It's not giving like a line reading, which is something else, yeah. which directors always tend to want to, they don't want to ever say to you, look, I don't want to give you a line reading. Mm -hmm. But they'll try, you know, to act it out in terms of, they could give, they could inspire you in yeah, a way. This is how I want you to do this sort of No, thing. yeah, not that, but yeah. just here, for example, this is how this person did it. Yeah. And if they do it well, and I've known directors to, to act out things very well, I've seen them do it, they do it very well, you know, so, well, it gives you a, like an insight into, the, into yeah. the way you can do it, it sort of frees you. Um, what do you think would be the good basis? for a good actor-director working relationship as um, a basis? They should like each other. I mean, this is for me. <laughs> That's true. A lot of guys, that could, could, uh, a lot of directors couldn't care less, uh, less if they liked the director, the actor, or the director, vice versa. But I, I, for me, it's important. You really, you know. Good traditional directors, it's okay. They have a very specific uh, thing in mind, a certain style that they arrive at in a certain way. And uh, that's okay. But a, a, a bad or not so good traditional director can be really uh, kind of boring in a sense. Here. Yeah. They don't want to take any chances. They don't want to hassle because there's a lot of money involved, and they don't yeah. want to. They don't want to just take any chances. On Taxi Driver, it was almost all imp improvisation, and it's so nice with him because he's uh, the only director that I I trust because he's he's so nervous and he's always putting his things into his pants and he's like, oh my god twirling his mustache and taking his pills for his ulcers and whatever he has that he's, he's so much in love with everything that he does that it helps the actors and, and it always helps the film sometimes it's really a technical thing it's a matter of how you work i like to be very loose it's funny when you do a movie sometimes a thing can be suggestive the situation can be suggestive um i was uh, I, I, an example i was uh, talking to a i'm doing a movie now about um uh, these uh, guys who uh, go to Vietnam and there's a sequence where they become prisoners of war and I was interviewing a prisoner of war a guy who had been there for a few years in a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam and now he teaches a sort of uh, a survival training school and he he does uh, since he's had the actual experience he, he puts these uh, trainees through the same uh, through a sort of a, an abbreviated course of what, he went of what he went through or what it would be a simulated course and, and being captured by uh, uh, the other side or whatever and uh, he was you know he would really get physical and, and, and do pretty much to a point to a degree what they would do to, and he was beginning yeah, to have nightmares and, and stuff like that. right not yeah. yeah but suggested not to the point of actually but maybe slapping and stuff like that it got so that what happens is he was he was beginning to get affected by it it was bringing back a lot of bad memories and stuff and sort of he was, yeah from what I understand, and uh, it was sort of, well, same with a movie, you can, sometimes things can, there's always a reality, I mean, you're always connected, you don't go off, you know, people ask me sometimes if you get in, if you're uh, acting, how can you separate your real life from, uh, and it's, you know, I mean, it's not like you, it's not that at all, it's just. Uh, you're sure that it was your idea? 
Until you look back on it, you see that he has really guided you into thinking that it's your idea. Therefore, he, he keeps uh, your pride going. And he never sacrifices an actor's feelings for time. I can, I can remember turning to Marty kind of jokingly, but seriously saying, what's my motivation for this scene? What, what, what is my exact motivation for this gun selling scene? And he looked at me after having a really difficult day in setting up shots. And he said, your motivation in this scene is if you don't get it right, I'm going to break every bone in your body. I'm going to rip your arms off and beat them over your head. I'm going to tear your legs out. That's your motivation. Now get out there and do it. Was it fun? <laughs> <laughs> do I have fun when I make it? Oh, boy. <laughs> boy. Well, sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. <laughs> sometimes we don't. Now we have some fun we're on the crane. Lately on New York, New York, and on uh, the last waltz, we're on the crane. That was fun. And uh, sometimes when we get some funny scenes with the actors, it's great, you know. Yeah. And this is the third film you've made about New York. Uh, well, it's not really about. I mean, in New York, New York, it's uh, the title. It's it's all shot in Hollywood. It's, it's got the. It's in, it's in well, the, there's no location shots. No location shots. No, it's uh, a film called New York, New York, shot entirely in Hollywood. What on the uh, old lots? On the old lots yeah. and the sound stages, and the old back lots. And uh, the idea was uh, kind of uh, taking the. the the look, the feel, the sense of an old film made in 1945-46 when I was a kid going to see movies, what it would have represented to me on the screen, that was supposed to be New York up there when I walked outside, that was really New York. But up on the screen, <laughs> right. I really, that was really New York, see? I believe yeah. that. Same For some reason, it was like an extension of a fantasy, but then taking the fantasy yeah. and putting a realistic situation against that. And having them dress like fantasy, having them dress, not, not, a, total fan, not, not a fantasy in, the, in terms of Lady in the Dark or thing like that, but I mean a fantasy in terms of uh, makeup, clothes, uh, the, the sets, the, the you know, shoulder pads are a little larger than usual, so that everything's a little exaggerated, yeah. and the sets are extra extraordinarily exaggerated, that sort of thing, so that you get a sense that you're watching, hopefully, if it's, if it's successful, you get a sense that you've seen that kind of film before. Well, uh, we're going to be right back. Two no, minutes. pay me now. I'm not going to pay you now, man. You think I'm not going to have a cab standing by in the middle of nowhere? Oh. We'll be back, back in a second, I think. Oh, you all right? Yeah, well, the you not? Yes, we, uh, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry about that. Are you the justice of the peace? That's right. You are. I'm sorry about the window. It's just, you know, we're a little anxious. Is there a possibility that we could be married now? We're in a bit of a hurry. I can't even explain to you why. I wish I could. You can see the way we look. Please close yourself, honey. Now? Yeah. Could you please just take about two minutes of your time? We'll make it worth your while. And I will pay for the glass, too. Could you please? Well, I guess it's Oh, yeah, we can arrange it. Yes, yeah, we yes. can arrange it. Come on. Come on. No, uh, just a minute. Can I tell you? Yeah. Aren't you sure? Yeah, just one second. You're kidding, right? You're kidding what? That was it? What was what? Your proposal? Yeah, get your coat on, put on your shoes. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. That was it? Well, what's wrong with that? You're not sure. Sure, sure, wait a minute. What's wrong with that? Well, I just guess I, I thought it was going to be different, you well, know? It was different. It's the way I do it. Anything wrong? There's nothing wrong. They're not sure, believe me. No, I just thought... Oh. Uh, what? Nothing. I, I just thought it would be different. You know what I mean? Different. It is different. I know it's different. Well, then what's the it's problem? It's not the kind of different I had in mind. The, problem? the kind of different I had in mind was maybe sweet and calm and... It is calm! And uh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's good. It's just a little... It's... And pretty, you know? What? Pretty. It's pretty! <laughs> You can't say that. It is pretty. You can't what look. Is, what? You can't say it's pretty. I want to marry you! What are you talking about? Please, go inside. Go inside. This is private. Would you wait, wait one second? Can I do this without matching yes, problems? Yes. yes. Um, is it fun? Yeah. Is it fun? Yeah, it is fun. It's fun even when it's not, uh... Is that all right? It's always fun with him. He cracks jokes. But 
the crew always knows. It's not like there are a crew of 75 people and they're all saying, well, you know, when is it going to be 6 o'clock so we can all go leave and make sure that we get our overtime pay. Well, well what about this? Well, ha what if I got up here? And, uh, uh, and he gets your energy level going to a point where you're just going, Jesus, this is great, let's get going. You know, uh, De Niro and myself and Marty were like three whirlwinds, just... Oh, let's try this, and let's do this, and let's get this done. And, uh, 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 oh, what a good idea. It's the only film I've ever done in my life where I can't remember sitting down. Usually on a movie set, you know, it's hurry up and wait. Yeah. Do you want me to kill myself over this dog? Oh, listen, when I say now, you back up. That's it. No Jimmy, I... Uh, wait a minute. Don't back up. Don't, sure. don't move. No. 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 Don't, don't shift. Don't do anything. Just stay. Will you please get out from under the... He just... He, this happens all the time. <laughs> Will you marry me? Will you marry me? I love you. Will you marry me? I don't want anybody else to be with you. I don't want anybody else with you. I want to be with you. Do you understand? I don't want anybody else to be with you except me. I love you. I love you. Oh, it was fabulous. And it was 22 weeks of sheer madness. Well, New York, New York is finished now. Finished it two days ago, finally. But now, tomorrow, I fly to New York. And if I arrive there... <laughs> well, yeah, I'm never too optimistic about planes. If I arrive there... Um, and come back alive, I will, uh, I will be still working on the film, in a sense, because I'm doing publicity. He has en endless energy and drive, yet physically he's not a strong man. What do you think accounts for this? Demons. I mean, we've all got him. We've got this little club of asthmatics, me and Marty and Schrader. There's a whole bunch of us here. When you completed Taxi Driver, I understand, I know you were pretty exhausted. Do you think if you don't take yourself to the limits physically and mentally, it, it may have a, some sort of effect on, on your work, because you do push yourself a lot. Uh, yeah, to a certain extent, I think that's true. I mean, you, I, I, I think it's true. I think Marty is probably the uh, president of the club, ex officio. He's got it the worst, and his, uh, his demons are the most overt. Brian's told you about that time when they all went to the movies, and Marty was practically passing out on, on the floor. Yeah. I remember, uh, sort of the funniest thing I remember was we had <laughs> we had we had gone to see I think it was Waterloo with that Russian director which I don't remember his name that also did War and Peace yeah and Marty was in one of his very sick stages he had terrible asthma and uh, uh, he was he had his girl he was there with his girlfriend and during the crucial battle scene she got very sad <laughs> that they were shooting the horses <laughs> So he got furious at her because she was getting upset and she was going to leave because they were shooting the horses. And so he, he got up and was going to take a swat at her and immediately had an asthma attack and fell underneath the seat. <laughs> and uh, I remember helping him up and, and by the time we got up and back on our seats, we had missed the whole reason that Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> it had happened while we were on the floor together. When, when you're working, is it sometimes lonely? Uh, yeah, but the thing is that you don't... I mean, there's a lot of people around you, but uh, the time, you do need time alone certain times, and that's very hard to get. When you do really need the time alone, it's hard to get. Usually when you, um, when you uh, don't want the time alone, uh, you got it. He can, he can be sitting in his dressing room alone with two, three people saying, I'm dying, and then go out on the set and hold the whole crew, 50 people, and all the actors and the producers on his back for 12 hours and keep that show moving at a steady pace. Just keep them plugging you along. You can really do that. Your brow is sweating and your mouth gets dry. I think that every 
every director worth anything. I mean, a man that makes films versus a man that takes a job to make a film. You know, who directs? I don't think Marty is a director. He, he really is a person that, that generates the energy behind everything that is accomplished in a, in a film. And I would think that a director of his stature only makes one film. That, uh, so that who's on knocking Mean Streets and, and uh, Taxi Driver and uh, Alice are all part and parcel of one film of the way one man feels. Well, I think all of his films are very musical, all of them. They're almost like operas. Yeah, how do you start this shot? What about here? Waltz came around the Thanksgiving Thanksgiving uh, concert that the band gave. That farewell concert was Thanksgiving, and that was two weeks after I had finished shooting. So the week, last week of shooting, they asked me if I could do it. And I said, well, great, it'd be like a great vacation because I love, love the music so much. And I went up there and got everybody together, and I figured at least we'd put it on film, record it. And then the stuff looked so nice that we decided to shoot a little more. And we shot some studio stuff, and we decided to shoot a little more, documentary. And it went on and on until finally United Artists bought that film also. And um, now it's uh, slated for release November 4th of this year. The music means a tremendous amount to him and everything he does. He listens to so much music, it drives me crazy. <laughs> I've been living with this man for months. He drives me nuts. I have to go and tell him, please, turn down the record player. Yeah, he did that last night, didn't he? Can you imagine? It's the, the first time in my you. life, in my whole experience of dealing with it, that I have had to go to somebody, you know, and tell him to turn down the music. So therefore, I knew that he was the right guy for the job. We found out that when, when we did the concert that night, that uh, there was a whole lot of thing happening, uh, a whole lot of things happening in the uh, in the cosmos. The stars were in the right positions. Ooh, the moon was just about right. The uh, whole setup was accidentally made to measure. And it makes no difference where I turn. I can't get over you when the flame still burns.
of fact, after we did that week of the shooting of uh, the White with the Staple Singers and Evangeline with Emmy Lou Harris and the theme from The Last Waltz, at the end of that week, I remember him telling me that he went into his office one morning and sat down and wrote on a piece of paper that it was the best time that he'd ever had in his life. He's like a painter when he edits. Yeah. Because we shot millions of film mm. for New York, New York, and I kept wondering how he was going to edit it because no two takes were ever alike. Right. And, but he, he's done it beautifully. A lot of things that, that sometimes you have to develop with a director depend to one degree or another. We have already built in because we've worked together a lot, yeah. and so we don't have to go through all that, and we understand. I admire the... Uh, the incredible force and vitality and the ruthlessness of his honesty, his emotional honesty in, in films. Uh, uh, I just wish he wouldn't cough so much when he makes them. He took art films, underground films, and he crossed over. He made them popular. He knew how to, to keep what he wanted, which is his view, which is his view as a director and uh, make it understandable to an audience. I think there's very little pretension in Marty's work. His films will last longer uh, because uh, emotions remain constant, but statements have a tendency to uh, change. Uh, a point that you make today about some social significance, unless it's done on a, on a, on a story and emotion level, you know, it changes. Uh, what works today uh, changes. I don't know. How, how do you sum up Marty? Jesus. <laughs> I'll see you later. I'll see you later. And uh, let there be a lesson to you. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Okay, bye-bye. Wait a minute, Marty! Get in the car. Come here. Come in. Nah, come here. See you tomorrow, right? Frankie, be good. What's the matter? Nothing. We just stiffed a couple of kids. Ah, how much you take them for? Twenty dollars. You left it about twenty dollars. Let's go to movies. That's right. And the movies I. What are you talking about? You might believe it. Across a meadow like a whip of will. He played out his heart just for time to pass. But as he looked to the ground, he noticed no shadow did he cast. Yeah. 
one of Martin Scorsese's greatest movies, Raging Bull, is next up on Gold tonight at 10 o'clock. At the same time on the movie channel, we've the erotic thriller Mortal Passions, and at 10 on Sky Movies, Tuesday night action with Dolph Lundgren and Brandon Lee in Showdown in Little Tokyo.